Welcome to Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Norm. I'm Adam. And I'm Brady Heron. Brady Heron! Yeah. It's very exciting to have you here in the cave on the podcast. Yes, yes. I, I can't think of a more distracting environment you could have put, <laughs> you could have put me in. You want me to pay attention and listen to you guys, and you've surrounded me with Apollo and Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark and all the things I love. There's no chance I'm going to be able to pay attention to your questions. Well, and you've, we've only, we've, put, we've pressed you, press ganged you into the podcast only like 20 minutes after you've arrived, too, so you haven't really had time to sink it in. No, no. But I'm, I, I'm a little starstruck struck having you here. I will tell you I've spent so many dozens of hours maybe almost a hundred hours of watching number file. My wife has wondered who the who I'm watching when I'm looking over. Who's that redhead? You know, oh no, I'm learning about math. And then ten minutes later she'll <laughs> say, Are you crying about geometry? And I'm like, it's, it's surpassingly so beautiful. beautiful, baby. <laughs> no. I uh, I I did a little calculation a couple of days ago. I have a few different YouTube channels and I added up all the minutes and hours people have spent watching it. Yeah. And it came to something like five and a half thousand years that people have spent watching the, the YouTube video. So that's how much time I've sucked out of uh, human existence. Human, so we did the same thing at the end of Mythbusters and I yeah. can't remember the number, but it was in the millions. Yeah. It was crazy yeah. when you, when you, the total number of viewers across the world across 13 years. Yeah. Um, people well, are watching. Yeah. I, I, so I, I would love to just start by asking you about Number File, about what got it started and uh, how you actually decide what to put up and, and travel around and where you record. I mean, there's a if I can go back a few steps, there's yeah. a few steps to how Number File Please. started. You have, to, you have to go back in time a bit to understand it. So I'm actually a journalist by trade. I was a newspaper journalist in Australia. And then I... But I was always interested in science and math and that sort of stuff. I, you know, I did a lot of science reporting, but I was just a normal newspaper journalist doing crime reporting and court reporting and politics and all the things a journalist does. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to the UK. And then what happened was I started working for the BBC, but for the BBC website, because mm -hmm. I was a newspaper, I had these writing skills. So I thought, well, I could tran if I wanted to transfer that into like the future as newspapers die out, the best thing to do would be to write for a website. But I was sort of a, I was always a little bit sort of out of left field creative with my ideas. And I was doing a few features and reports for the BBC website that were quite alternative and different and really interesting. And, and they really liked what I was doing, but I was only doing it for the website. And this was at a time where the BBC was very TV focused and the website was new and almost an afterthought. Right. So they were thinking, we've got this guy who's doing all this really interesting stuff this would be great for TV, but he's just coming back at the end of the day and writing up an article and we've got no television. So what they did was they trained me to be like this one man band TV production person. Oh. So to film, to edit, to do everything myself. And I, when I went off on these wacky adventures, I would also come back with something that could go on the TV. Right. In LA they call them predators. Yeah, well, producer, really? producer editors. Oh, well, predators. They were called VJs or video journalists. They're still called VJs at the BBC, but yeah. So it was, it was, I was doing that, and then I started working for television, and then I never really looked back. So I'd become this kind of one-man television production facility. Yeah. And then in my spare time on another project, I started making films with scientists at the University of Nottingham. I was based in Nottingham at the time, the home of Robin Hood. Uh -huh. um, and so I was, I was doing this project and my plan was I was going to sort of embed myself with all these scientists at the university. And what I wanted to do was show what it was really like to be a scientist, not sort of the TV version of science, mm -hmm. but like the heartbreak of a day or a week or a month in the lab and things not working and grant applications and like the grind of science as well as like the great moments of science. And then I wanted to spend this year embedded, capture all this footage and then turn it into like maybe a two hour film at the end. And I reckon a few weeks into this project that I was doing in my spare time, I realized this is like such a waste of time. I'm gonna record and film all this amazing stuff and at the end make this two hour film that maybe no one will watch. Almost everything I've filmed will end up on the cutting room floor. I'll only keep the good stuff and I'll end up becoming what I'm trying to get around anyway. And But this was around the time YouTube was pretty new. So I said to the people at the university who I was kind of working with, do you know what, instead of working towards this film off in the future, why don't every day when I film with you guys, why don't we just 
pretty much just dump it all on YouTube and have this ongoing series. It could be two minutes long. It could be 20 minutes long. Just dump everything on YouTube and show what it's really like to be a scientist. So we started this, this YouTube channel. It was called Test Tube. So there's stage one. Right? <laughs> we are getting to number five, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what's going on. And and this is this was before you could monetize content on YouTube. This right. was really, really new YouTube. And we had one video that I made about with one scientist about who was collecting worms from a river. That was a quirky little film and it went viral. <laughs> it got 80,000 views <laughs> and our heads exploded. We just made something that had been watched 80,000 times. You laugh and I laugh like 80,000 now like is probably a failure of a video on some channels. But but the, to us, this was this was like it's groundbreaking. Yeah, yeah. We'd reached 80,000 people with an online video. This is unheard of. So it became like a big thing at the university now. This guy who's working on this project is having all this success. And as a result of that, I was introduced to a chemist at the University of Nottingham who'd heard about it and wanted to meet me called Martin Polyakov. And he's like a very famous, uh, prestigious chemist. He's also the brother of a very famous filmmaker in the UK called Stephen Polyakov. So he's also interested in TV and film. And I went and I met with him and he's in such a character. He's got this big frizzy hairstyle like Einstein and yeah. he waves his hands around when he talks and he's got this encyclopedic knowledge of chemistry. And he, the, the idea was maybe he was going to become one of the characters in this series I was doing. And I sat there in his office and it's full of periodic tables and it brought back all this nostalgia for the periodic table yeah. in my high school days. And I said to him, do you know what? I've had another idea. We should do a separate project where we make a video about every single element on the periodic table. Mm. Like, and like, that seems like a really obvious idea now, but yeah. at, at the time, you know, YouTube's pretty new and it's- Yeah, that's, it on, seems like a quite a weird departure yeah. for like maybe, yeah. Yeah, and it's like, it's 118 videos, there's 118 mm. elements. So it's like, and he's sort of, well, why don't we just do groups or rows or cluster them so we don't have to make so many films? And I said, <laughs> no, 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 no. We have to do every single element. That's what will make us different. Yes. That's what will make us like get get us attention. That's right. you know, you always succeed by doing what the other guy's not willing to do. So he got a little bit of funding for it to help pay for a bit of my time. And in, and bearing in mind I'm still full time at the BBC, <laughs> we hit the periodic table hard. And we we were doing we had had these long filming days where sometimes I would just say to him, like with obscure elements, I would say, All right, what do you know about tellurium and he would just talk off the top of his head for two or three minutes and we'd turn that into a video more famous elements like hydrogen we'd go and blow stuff up and, yeah, and yeah. do your your mythbusters style cool <laughs> cool films but other ones you know we just churned them out and we did 118 videos in six weeks what wow. yeah. what so oh. i was staying up till like 4 a.m editing this stuff oh my and God, going that makes to work me tired just hearing yeah, about it, that. Was, it was really tiring i thought you were going to say six months yeah. and i was going to be impressed <laughs> no no we, we hit it hard i mean some of them are pretty ropey fit videos but like but some of them are really good and then we had another one of those real lucky breaks in life and uh a newspaper saw what we were doing and the, the Telegraph in London and they wrote an article saying, look what these crazy people are doing. They're doing all 118 <laughs> elements. Exactly what I'd said we had to do to get right, attention. Right, yeah. um, so then that project went kind of viral and became popular on, on YouTube. And at that point, when we'd done all 118, we now had all these subscribers and this audience, so we couldn't stop. So we, we decided let's keep it going. And Periodic Videos is what the channel's called and it still runs today and it's like a, it's just become a chemistry channel. We still make element videos. Mm. We're updating some of those ruby ones we Amazing. did at the start. But it's just a general chemistry channel. There's over 500 videos on it. I could tell you a million stories about all the, all the things we've done. <laughs> Great fun. The physics department at the University of Nottingham got jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they said, you should, you know, we should, we should do a project about physics as well. So we started a physics channel, which is called 60 Symbols. And it's also really popular and has been really successful. And at this point, I was working too much and I left the BBC. I was, <laughs> I was earning enough now from, you know, grants from the university and things to, to leave the BBC and get by. So these channels are going along quite nicely. Now we'll get to number five, I promise. <laughs> At this point, YouTube itself had a small grant to seed starting new educational channels. Yeah. And they, they had seen that I was having some success with educational channels. So they said to me, if we gave you some money for like six months or a year to start some new channels, what would you do? And I had two ideas. One was about astronomy. And we started that. It's called Deep Sky Videos. It's still going. I'm very proud of it. And then also the other one was Numberphile. I said, I'd like to do a math channel. This is how I'd tackle it. Uh, 
center it around numbers to start with. It's kind of drifted off from that a bit, but make make each video about a number. In the same way periodic videos, each one was about an element. This yeah. would be each one yeah. about a number. They said, all right, here's some funding. I started the channel interviewing mathematicians and mathy people. And that that channel, above all others, blew, really blew up and has become the biggest and most successful one I work on. And now that's kind of, you know, takes up probably a third of my time, number mm-hmm. five. So that that has become the the big channel. That funding from YouTube expired, but since then a math institute here in Berkeley, mm-hmm. not far from where we're sitting, just across the bay, uh, helps out with funding, but also introducing me to mathematicians and that. And number five has just become this kind of monster that has uh, taken over my life. Well, it, it, it's the thing that I've loved most about it. And I talk about it as a, as a science educator, someone who's accidentally stumbled into it. Yeah. Uh, I get asked about educating kids a lot and I love pointing out number file as you know, the way that maths are often taught in school is as a collection of monolithic things to just know. You're just taught that it's this building full of facts that you're supposed to memorize, your times tables, etc. And every mathematician will tell you it is this landscape of all sorts of wonderful mystery and craziness and wonderful confluences of strange things. And that's what I get from, I, 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 like I joked that I only understand about a third of what happens in any given video. But the, the degree to which, you know, I, you had on a, a mathematician who was talking about, a, um, and I can't even remember the problem, a problem that she solved when she was in grade school about geometry making a proof about geometry. And then she walked through the history of that proof. And I, that was the one that actually I got choked up watching because I found it so moving. And my wife was, are you crying about math? And I said, <laughs> yes, I am, <laughs> because it's so beautiful. Yeah. Um, you, you take something that people don't think of as creative. In fact, a lot of people think of maths as the opposite of creativity and yeah. show deep how how deeply creative it really is. I was just having a conversation a couple of hours ago where I kind of, something came out of my mouth that I don't think I'd said before, and I think you've kind of also just said it then, and I think maybe it's one of the reasons that number file appeals so much to you, but also why, why it appeals to me, and that is I feel like in at this time in history, there's kind of, we're kind of running out of like frontiers and and discoveries and like you know we're not going to climb to the top of a mountain that hasn't been climbed before mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. we've been to the moon hopefully we go further but you know yeah. we've been to the moon someone has had that moment where they ca- came over a rise and saw the grand canyon some everything's kind of has has been done and it's this kind of like oh i wish i lived back in the time where there was all this unexplored landscape but mathematics is completely there it's this it's this landscape where Around every corner and every day, there's something brand new that you can be the first person to see. You can be the first person to understand. You can plant your flag on some number or some proof or something, and it's happening every single day, and you don't even have to leave your office to do it. So it's this its this whole world of discovery and adventure that I, clearly you you love with your oh, interest no. so, in Apollo. And, so I, and I it's there. Ex- it's right there all the time. And I have an example that I love, and I actually can't remember it exactly well because my, my, my powers of recall are diminishing as I grow older. <laughs> um, but it's the couch... Moving uh, up a stairs problem. Oh, around a corner. Doing yes. a, a couch around a corner. A couch around a can you explain that problem a little bit? Well, I'm a bit the same. I've made I've made like thousands of videos <laughs> and like I've got like a one in, one out policy on information so, in my head. A, but, a friend of mine once told me years ago, he said within within knots. It only yeah. takes three or four loops before you've become so computationally complex, it's yeah. almost impossible yeah. to model what's happening mm. in a knot. Yeah. And the couch problem is one of these same things, that, yeah. it's, that it's super non-trivial to calculate whether a couch can make it upstairs into we an apartment. a whole yeah. Friends episode out of it. Yeah, I mean, this is, yeah, I mean, basically this is you've got a couch that you have to maneuver around a corner, a corridor that has like a right angle turn in it. And... There are whole. There are these couch moving problems. Take away, take away that third dimension. You can't lift it up and things like angle that. It, okay. Yeah, you can't angle it. You've just got to, you've just got to push it and wiggle it on, like you know, in a two D plane. And there are there are things like what is the op, what's the biggest couch you can have, and what's the optimal shape you can have for a couch that would let you, like, to get the biggest possible couch around a corner without getting jammed. There's a guy who I think he's at UC Davis who made some new discoveries with it. There's a whole there's a whole right, number. So the five idea that that's an undiscovered country, yeah. right? Like, yeah. I I've I happen to have a, a spatial 
awareness where one of my secret powers is I can look at a piece of furniture and I'm usually right about whether it can move through a space <laughs> oh, or I don't not. have that. But I'm doing calculations <laughs> that strike me as like, well, someone's figured this out. No, it turns out there's this whole area that yeah. hasn't been determined. Yeah, yet. I've sawn couches in half because of my, in my inability to do that. But yeah. Protocol, I, always protocol. Yeah. I once had to give up a bed. Yeah. I once had to, yeah. I had a canopy bed. I was trying to move it into a new apartment. Yeah. Nah, I had to, I had to get rid I of it. I got one in, but couldn't get it out. <laughs> I, had to, I had to cut it in half to get it out. I made a YouTube video of the cutting in half. I thought I'd at least get some value from this couches. Before we continue with the conversation, I want to let you know that support for this week's episode of Still Entitled comes from Netgear. Is your Wi-Fi feeling old? Does it buffer while streaming? Does connecting to new devices slow it down? Can it handle gaming, video calls, large file transfers all at once? It doesn't matter how fast your internet connection is if your Wi-Fi router is old and outdated. With Orbi Wi-Fi 6 from Netgear, your Wi-Fi will feel new again. Wi-Fi 6 is the latest tech that allows for more devices to connect and stream simultaneously simultaneously without impacting speed or reliability. The result delivers the fastest Wi-Fi for all your devices anywhere in your home. Stream in HD, 4K, or even 8K without buffering. Eliminate lag while gaming and connect to more devices to your Wi-Fi than ever before. Because we all have so many devices. Orbi Wi-Fi 6 is like upgrading your Wi-Fi to first class. And if you're ready to take off with the best Wi-Fi ever, you can get it today from Netgear and never worry about Wi-Fi again. Check out Orbi Wi-Fi 6 at your local Best Buy or at netgear.com slash best Wi-Fi. That's netgear.com slash best Wi-Fi. Now back to the conversation. I actually, there's just been a recent thing that's happened in number file that plays very well into that that I thought I might tell you about if, yeah, you, if, yeah. you're, if you're ready for some yeah. numbers. Oh, please, bring it on. All right. This is, <laughs> I'm not a mathematician, so I'm not very good at giving math talks, but I think I can understand this. So basically... This is all about the sums of three cubes. Okay. So any number, let's say any number can be made by adding up three cubes, three cube numbers. And I'll give you some examples just so you can hold it in your head. 11, right? You can write the number 11 as three cubed, which is 27, mm -hmm. plus minus two cubed, which is uh, minus eight, eight, plus minus two cubed, minus eight. If you add them all together, you get 11. Right? Yep, 27 minus 16. There you go. You could do that. They can get harder. You can get 21, for example. 21, let's, let, I'm just choosing arbitrary numbers. 21 is 16 cubed plus minus 14 cubed plus minus 11 cubed. That's a bit hard, right? You can't do them yeah, in your head. Yeah, yeah. Take my word for it. Okay. Right? <laughs> okay. So mathematicians think that every single number can be expressed as a sum of three cubes, just like those two examples I gave you. Integer. If you choose, you can only use integers. Yeah, yeah. you can't use fractions and things like that, or you, you have to use integers. And a new one, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so, this is, so this is where things were, right? The theory is the that The theory number... is, it's not proven, the theory is, and we can sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil or with a computer and pick numbers and say, yeah, okay, there it is. So this is, this is a theory. This is a, it's not a theorem, it's a conjecture. Okay. Okay. Now, I've already told you a lie <laughs> because there are certain numbers you cannot do it with. There are exceptions and it's proven you can't do it with these numbers. I'll, and I'll just quickly to explain what they are. Four, you can't do it. Five, you can't do it. So four and five, you can't do it. And then if you go up eight, you go up another eight numbers until you get to 13 and 14. You can't do 13 and 14. Hmm. Go up another eight. 22 and 23. So there are these, oh, pa there are these, pairs, these pairs. There are these pairs of numbers. And that's very easy. Well, that's understandable as to why that happens. There's a video about it on number file. You can watch it. Like that, that's proven. But every other number. So let's. We're not gonna. We're gonna forget about those exceptions. Okay. <laughs> every other. Every other number. If you have long enough, or a computer scientist, mathematicians think you can do it, but they can't prove it. <laughs> and for a long time, they were setting computers loose on the problem just to just to almost like just picking off numbers one at a time to, to find out, you know, to, to confirm in their heads, yeah, we're on the right track. This must be true. There were three numbers below 100 that they should have been able to crack that they couldn't. Oh, can I guess? I think I remember one of them is a really important number yes. to Douglas Adams fans. Yes, yes. 42, 42 was one of them. 42, yes. <laughs> 33 was the lowest. Then there was 42 and then there was 74. 
All right. So we made a we made a number five video about this. It was called the uncracked problem with thirty three, <laughs> and we explained the problem and said, here's you know, what do you think? Here's, here's the thing. They think it's true. They don't know. Here are three numbers below hundred. They can't even find. And they'd set computers loose on this problem, and they'd gone deep on these three numbers, and they couldn't find it. So we we made this this video, and then a few weeks later. This guy, somewhere in Europe, I can't remember what country he's from, but I remember his name, Sander Hoosman. He got in touch and he'd put a computer at his universe, university loose on the problem and he tweaked an algorithm a bit, but he pretty much just used the same old algorithm. And he cracked 74. He, fa he found these three, three these three numbers. Cubes. So they were they were 15 digits long. These numbers. So that, <laughs> so so when I told you 11, you know we were using numbers like yeah. three and two. Yeah. But to, for 74, it just so happened you had the first numbers you could use that would help you solve the problem. They existed, but they were 15 digits long. This is kind of like what we're talking about. These explorers. Right. You know he's found these numbers. They look like telephone numbers. Right. But this number has is suddenly special and important. And if you put them into a wall from Alpha and now you do the cubes, it will spit out the right answer. But the day before, if I would put those numbers into a wall from Alpha, I would have found it. But I didn't find it. This other guy, this other wow. guy found it. So he was a, he was like an explorer, and he yeah. found yeah. he found this number, and that was really cool. So we made a uh, another number file video all about seventy four has been cracked. Isn't this amazing? And by this, you know, this amateur mathematician. So another mathematician had watched this video. And he thought, all right, this, is, this has motivated me. We can do better here. <laughs> and he came up with some new algorithms and new sieves and ways to make this search better. And then he used a supercomputer at his university. He's at University of Bristol where they have a very powerful computer. And they chucked, they chucked the, the algorithm in and said, all right, what can you find? And not, I think it was a few weeks later, out dropped these three more numbers and they cracked 33. Wow. And now this time they were, they were, what they, they were 16. They were 16 digit long numbers. So, <laughs> so he, he cracked it, you know, 33, the lowest pre, the lowest number that we haven't been able to find. Now we've got it. We found, we found the code for that. So that left 42, that left our famous Douglas, Douglas Adams number. And so we made a video about this. This video was watched by so a, a company, an organization called Charity Engine. And what Charity Engine do is they uh, network people's computers together in their spare time to make these global supercomputers. Like you know, the SETI Institute that, did that, back when. That kind yeah. of stuff, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So they, they do that and they use it for, uh, they sell the computing time and the money goes for charitable causes and stuff oh, like nice. that. So they, they, saw that, they saw this and this uh, piqued their interest. So they said, we re we can give you a more powerful computer. Do you want to do you want to let it loose and see if we can find forty two? So they fed in the algorithm into this now Uber Uber computer, and like a few hours later, <laughs> wow! a few hours later, out dropped these seventeen digit numbers and forty two. 42 had been cracked. 15, 16, and 17 yeah. digit numbers. Yeah. So those orders of magnitude like, in terms of a scale of computation. Yeah, yeah cra cra you know, it was crazy. And like for year for 50 years, people have been using powerful computers, but mm. they couldn't search that high. And that's that's where these elusive first examples were for that. So anyway, I'm sure people listening and even you might be saying, where does this stop? Like <laughs> until you have like an actual rigorous proof for all numbers, you're kind of now just picking them off one at a time. This does serve a purpose because it's telling mathematicians it's probably true you're heading in the right direction. But what we really need is someone to prove beyond any doubt that this is true for all numbers. That proof is still yet to, to come out and that, you know, greatness awaits for the, the person wow. who does that. But I said to the, this guy who's doing it, his name's Andrew Booker, and I said to him, you know, where do you stop? What do you do next? And this is where something I, I've omitted deliberately one fact that I will tell you now, and that is mathematicians don't just think every number can be done. They think every number can be done an infinite number of ways. So once you find a way to express any number as a sum of three cubes, keep going. There's another one out there further down the road. Oh, my gosh. So there's an infinite number of ways to do every number. <laughs> just think about 42. The first time you can do it, you need this 17-digit number 
but there are an infinite number of other ways of to three do three different <laughs> integers. <laughs> cube. Yeah, yeah. There's, there are an infinite number of ways still waiting down the road. Yeah. So, so I said to Andrew, what do you do next? I think the next unsolved number is like 120 something or 140 something. You know, there are 10 more numbers below a thousand they haven't done. And I said, you know, he said, yeah, okay, we might do them, but this is getting kind of, <laughs> kind of pointless. But there was one more puzzle that, that he wanted, one more trophy that he wanted. And that was the number three. Because when the original paper about this problem was written in the 1950s, he three was used as like a, a, an example, a model example. There's a very, very obvious way to write three as the sum of three cubes. Yeah, one by one. One cubed plus one cubed plus one. There's another way that isn't isn't that hard to come up with, uh, which is minus five, four, and four. That will also mm. give you three. Mm -hmm. and this mm -hmm. has been known for a long time. And when this paper was written, this guy wrote... He'd looked for the next one. To, because if you think there are an infinite number of ones, where's the next one? He couldn't find the next one with the computers of the time. And for 50 years, they'd been trying to find another one for three, just because three was the example used in this paper. Yeah. A lot of the numbers, we know loads and loads of ways to do it. You know, there are whole lists and lists of ways to do different numbers. But oh three, gosh. they were stuck on two. They couldn't find another way to do it. So this was the last thing Andrew wanted to do. And he said to the people at Charity Engine, I've got one more I want you uh, one more I want you to feed in. So they checked they checked in and they looked for a way to do 3 and they found it. Wow. <laughs> they found it. This took a bit longer and this time you had 21 digit oh long God, numbers. So isn't that amazing? The number 3 111 minus 544 and you think, "Oh, what's next?" The next number that does it, <laughs> 21 digit long numbers to do it. And still you can look at that number scale and think, "Well, it's that that's the that's, that's the first gateway to yeah, infinity. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You're not even yeah, you haven't even you haven't even started on the path to infinity. You haven't even there are an infinite number of ways to do it. There are an infinite number of sets of numbers to do it. And I think like this story, I quite like this story because it shows how the modern communication and YouTube and that is can actually help progress the field. Like mm -hmm, I feel mm -hmm. like in some 0.01% of a way, number file has helped as a bit of a matchmaker and a communicator. But also I think this really, t like this, this sort of stuff gives me chills thinking about these numbers that are lurking out there that like this 21 digit long number that you would just walk past on the number line and right. think nothing of. But hang on, that number's a gold nugget to someone. To Andrew, that number was a gold nugget. That was a solution he was looking for to this, um, to this amazing puzzle that is, that is fascinating. And there's still a proof out there waiting for someone to find. There are all these answers out there waiting to be found. And this is like, this is this world of discovery and adventure and exploration and you don't need to spend billions and billions to build rockets and spacesuits to go and find these trophies and have these amazing moments you just need to be clever and maybe have a powerful computer sometimes well, and the, the the using the platform to widen the the cultural consciousness about these problems and open source their solutions this is a debate that's happening very significantly in science communication within academia, at least in the US. I see a lot of debate between an old guard and a new guard and the old guard doesn't want, doesn't think it's proper for working scientists, publishing scientists to be posting stuff on Twitter and talking about their disciplines. Meanwhile, there's this young guard that says, absolutely. And I, I personally, I follow this bird, a bunch of bird Twitter, a bunch of lizard Twitter, <laughs> herpetologists. And I find in each of these communities, the same kind of love and passion and excitement that I've learned to see in, in number file. Yeah. And it's a really, to me, that's really exciting because it does, it broadens the horizons and tells other people these are undiscovered, these are places where you can make a mark and you can discover something no one's found before. There's a, there's a few things going on there in that point you raise. It's a really interesting uh, part of science communication internally. I mean, it's a bit inside baseball, but it's very true. And there are a few things going on. One is... You're right. There is like this conservative feeling that this just isn't the way. This isn't the old the old way. There's also maybe a little bit of like, you know, maybe a bit of like jealousy and oh, so ego. And so, yeah, ego. So and so is a bit of a show pony, and they're getting more attention than me. But I think I'm a better scientist, and that's not right. Mm -hmm. So that kind mm -hmm. of thing's going on. There and there are legitimate concerns about putting science out there, like not through sort of peer reviewed methods. And I get all of that. Certainly. But there's one thing that's changing everyone's tune very quickly. And it changes, and it changes. People, people uh, change their position quite quickly sometimes when they realise this. And that is, most of these people are publicly funded. They're funded with, uh, you know, our our money, and 
A, a, I think that means they have a responsibility to communicate with us and share what they're doing. Yeah. But also, more and more, this money is being doled out based on, you know, public impact. Is there is there is there a good is there a good to this research and things like that? And it's it can I can imagine it's quite hard for a mathematician or some pure science people to say exactly what their their public good of their work is. And nor do I think they should have to. I think there should be pure research going on. But one of the things they can do when they're applying for this money is if you say, look, I've been doing this math research. Oh, and by the way, I've made a couple of videos about it and they've been watched 10 million times. Yeah. The people giving out the money suddenly say, oh, that seems like a good use of our money. Lots and lots of people know about it. Lots and lots of people have been able to right. enjoy the research in some way for very little effort for the researcher. You know, sometimes yeah. it's just sitting down with me for half an hour. So I think as more and more researchers are realising, if I put my research out there and I'm willing to talk about it and just share it, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, you're not going to cure cancer with the sum of three cubes, but if you're just willing to talk about it and share it and let people enjoy it and enjoy this this exploration that we're going on and make it more of a communal and thing. And learn that there is joy there. Yes, Yes, exactly. I think that that helps with funding. And Absolutely. when you talk to a scientist or a mathematician about better ways to get funding, then you have the retention. <laughs> Their ears come up. Yeah. Um, I, I'm curious as a non-mathematician and in the in the thousands of videos that you've made, um, where has where do you feel your mind has been most opened, or is there a place in which you've had an aha moment? I have to say, I am also not a mathematician and a non-scientist, so I, I'm I'm on the same same boat as you. But do you know it kind of happens every day? Like it yeah. happens. You, I'll be sitting there, and someone will tell me something, and like I'll just get chills. Like, and literally the hairs will stand up just because they've told me about some number or something. And problem. I've gotten that alongside you. Yeah. What I notice on the, in the number file of it is, is you often ask the question that's just occurred to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's when I'm doing my job right. Yeah. And that's a journalist background. Yeah, I think so. After I, that, is, that is one of like the best compliments I get. I do hear that a lot. Oh, that's amazing. You asked the question that I was just mm -hmm. thinking of. So maybe that's like... I mean, I'm far from the world's best camera operator and editor, so maybe, maybe one of the my unique selling points is maybe I have some knack for asking the right questions sometimes. But Do you find you have to handhold mathematicians much at all, or like they are? S I don't. I don't think so. I think like you, you have to talk to a lot of teachers. You talk to a lot of people who teach. Some of them are teachers, but some of them are pure researchers too. Oh, okay. And like, yeah, I mean, yeah, with someone who is already a math communicator, someone like a Matt Parker or yeah. a James Grime or someone like that, you know, I'm basically just a, a <laughs> tripod. Like, I know, I'm just... I'm, but, you know, Matt came here a few weeks ago. Yes, he was yes. on a Sunday, so that's why we didn't have him on the cast, but it was it was yeah. delightful having him. Yeah, here. no, he's, he's fantastic. So, um, so with those people, obviously, that's incredibly easy. But with mathematicians, I find you always get there. I remember like getting a piece of advice as a film as a filmmaker when I was doing my training at the BBC. That was the best advice I ever got. And it's always the first advice I give to someone who does a job like me. And that is when you go to interview someone about anything, the first thing you should do is put your camera down in the corner and not even open the bag or acknowledge the presence of the camera for the first half hour or an hour that you're there because it's really intimidating. Cameras are really intimidating. Yeah, yeah. But also you're not going to find find it, find stuff. Once the camera comes out, everything's locked in and everyone goes into a certain mode. There's a really good story that once happened to me, and it's a good example of that. I went to the physics department at the University of Nottingham, and I, I can't even remember what I was going there to make a film about. And I walked into this lab with this, with this guy, and I had put my camera away because I just wanted to chat to him, wanted to get to know him, have a cup of tea, talk about life. Look at your office. Oh, what's that? A picture? Oh, you went. You went. You're a climber, are you? You know, you talk about. And there was a piece of kit in the middle of his office. This big monstrosity of a machine that was looked really amazing to me. It would fit in in this in the cave here really well because <laughs> it looked like something from the future. Uh, and I and it wasn't what we were there to talk about. And I said to him, "What's that? What's that thing?" And he said, "Oh, that's a laser cooling device." And I'd never heard of a laser cooling device. I said to him, "How does it work? What does it do?" And he explained to me, we get a small number of atoms, like cesium atoms, and we trap them in the middle of this vacuum. And we fire lasers at the atoms from all these different directions, all these different angles, to trap them in place and stop them jiggling to make them almost stationary. And of course, jiggling is heat. 
You know, right. atoms right. jiggling is what makes them warm. And if you can make them jiggle less and less and less, they become closer and closer to absolute zero. You can't actually get to absolute zero, but you can get really close. This is what he explained to me. Uh -huh. And I said, how close, how close to zero can you get? And he told me some number in micro Kelvins or some right, impossibly yeah. small number. And I said, how cold is that? I don't understand how cold that is. You know, is that, you know, is that colder than the moon? And he like, laughed that off. Oh, that's much, much colder than the moon. <laughs> is that colder than space? You know, colder than space between planets. And he's like, much, much colder than that. What about like the space between stars or the space between galaxies? <laughs> no, 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 you're not understanding. This is much, much colder than that. So then I stopped and I said to him, are you telling me that right now this device I'm standing next to inside it is the coldest place in the universe? And he went, uh, yes. Yes, it is. And he had never thought of it. It had, it, it had never occurred to him. To him, that was just work. That was right, his job. Right, right. And he'd never, he'd never looked at it through these eyes. And he suddenly said, yes, the coldest place in the universe is my office. And wow. I said, that's awesome. You know, we should make a video about that instead. And he was like, yeah, let's do it. And like, so we made a video about this, you know, this thing he had. And that came because... I didn't just get out my camera yeah. and get on with business and say, this, right. is, this is the film we're here to make today. I put it down. I had a cup of tea. I was curious and I chatted to him and it changed everything. It changed the whole direction of what we're doing. I think in modern filmmaking and TV programs, you know, so often you turn up with a preconceived idea of what you're there to make. Yeah. And sometimes you have to do that because yeah. of the logistics and things like that. But other times, you know, you can miss the real story. And I think, you know, as a journalist and someone, I, I like to find that real story sometimes. And sometimes that means just pressing pause and not just barreling on with production and talking to a human yeah. and finding the way into the story. That was a good example of that happening. Something, something along this line happened to Jamie and I once. We went and gave a talk at IBM's research facility down here in Silicon Valley. And after our talk, this guy came over and he said, would you guys like to move some atoms around? <laughs> and we were like, yeah, we want to move some atoms around. And they took us to this room that was like, you know, two by two meters with just... It looked like um, a movie set of Doc Brown's research, right? So it's just nothing but gauges and meters and machines everywhere. And they're like, this, this is our thing that can get to, um, to five Kelvin, five degrees above absolute zero. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. And they, yeah, they worked out this thing, but this isn't where we're going to move atoms. This is, and I was like, is this the coldest anyone's got? And they're like, no. And I said, what, what's the coldest you guys? Well, this new facility goes to one tenth of that, 0.5 Kelvin. And I'm like, yeah, fuck five Kelvin. <laughs> oh, I'm, that's t shirt weather. <laughs> <laughs> and the degree, and I, then I was like, so one of you understands every machine in this room. And they were like, yes, actually. That's true. And I'm like, and I mean, like, you understand all the wires coming in and out of every single machine in here so that I can look at a monitor and move a single sodium atom over two atoms distance. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, yeah, that is, and I found it was thrilling to be in that space. What did you do? Brains. What did you do with the moon? Did you write your initials or something? Or? No, it was, uh, so they had, they were, they had like six sodium atoms lined up right. on a, on a bed of, Copper, I think that's the thing, and that's right. like when you heat it, and you were able to move over and just like move one over. Yeah, they famously wrote IBM with that yes. machine. That's yeah. right. Yeah, so yeah, it's fantastic. Amazing. I mean, one of the biggest takeaways I think from this conversation is back to the beginning, how you began it. it you just did it, right? You had the idea that you an ambition to maybe spend a year making a two-hour documentary, which is a very traditional way. And plenty of people have success doing that, but instead you decided just to put things out, and which doesn't stop you from making that documentary with the footage you have now. No, no, you're right. I, I think, like, I mean, you know, it's very appropriate to be having this conversation with someone like Adam in this room full of stuff, a lot of which he's made. And that is, you can, I, you, you've just got to make stuff. Yeah. And so, so often people... Um, might come up to me at like a conference or something and say, oh, Brady, I've made this video and I think it's really good. I've put like months of my life into it and I've made it and just not that many people are watching it. What, do I, what have I got to do to make more people? How do I make this film more successful? You know, I feel like it's not getting the attention it deserves. And they're probably right. It's probably some masterpiece that I couldn't dream of making. But my advice to that person, no matter what they've made, is... Make the next thing. Yeah. Don't don't just sit there lamenting that the thing you made isn't getting enough attention and succeeding. Make another thing and another thing and another thing because then there are numerous reasons to do that. One is 
you'll get better. You'll get better at it. You're increasing your surface area. So the chance of you getting lucky increases, yeah. you know, the first film or the first thing you get discovered for might not be the best thing you've ever made. It might just be dumb luck. It might be that newspaper article or the right person at the right time. And then people might go back and watch all your previous stuff anyway. But when you do get discovered and people stumble upon you, the worst thing that could happen is you've only made one thing. Because if I if I stumble right, over right. Adam Savage and I say, oh, this guy's good. What else? Have, what else has he done? And there's nothing, and there's nothing there. there. Yeah. Well, that was a nice. It was nice meeting you, and I'll never meet you again. Whereas if you've already made, been making stuff for months, people will go back and watch your back catalogue. They'll realise that you're prolific, so they'll subscribe and start watching you, or think, what's this person doing next? You know, if you make one masterpiece and then spend the rest of your life trying to promote it or lamenting that it's not getting the attention it deserves. Yeah, you might be right. You may well have made the Citizen Kane of YouTube videos, but that doesn't change the fact you're not quite having the luck. Just keep keep making stuff because the people who succeed are the people who are staying up until 4 a.m. making 118 well, I mean, videos it's, in it's six weeks. It's this very thing of like the on, the on paper, the idea of I'm going to make hundreds and hundreds of videos about math and people are going to be fascinated by it. Sounds like a crazy proposition. And then my intersection was Graham's number, a number so large, if you knew it, your head would collapse into a black hole. And that was your opener for that video. And I have forever been captured by that wonderful construction. Graham's non number. Non-allegorical construction. Graham's number is like, um, is a spe Graham's number is the reason number file exists. It is the greatest thing. Yeah. That was when I was a kid, like. What kid isn't obsessed with the Guinness Book of Records? Right. I certainly was. And I, and <laughs> totally. I, and I, I remember we got, I got into the Guinness Book of Records eventually by making a small periodic table on one of the professor's hairs. <laughs> that, that's another story. But as a kid, Graham's number in the Guinness Book of Records. And my fact, we hadn't come up with that black hole fact. My fact that I remember was if all of the universe was turned into ink, you still wouldn't have enough ink to write down Graham's number, <laughs> <laughs> which, which I which I was like, and I would even like I would as a boy I would tell that story to little kids to amaze them oh. about, and then so when I started making number file high on my list was Graham's number. We made it with Tony Padilla who came up with that black hole fact and Matt Parker, but then a, a few years later I was here in California talking to some mathematicians about. Graham's number and someone said, oh, I'm really good friends with Ron Graham and picked up the phone and said, oh, Brady Harron's here. Do you want to do a video with him? And the next day I was on a plane down to San Diego oh. sitting in Ron Graham's lounge room making a film about Graham's number with Graham himself. So that was like... In number five, we write on these pieces of brown paper. Which are, I, I, by the way... Within this collection, I hope one day to add one of those pieces of brown paper. Oh wow, we might be able to we might be able to sort you out at some <laughs> point. We'll see. But but um, so the only one that I have framed on the wall, and we've, there are thousands of them. These these bits of paper that mathematicians scribble on is Ron Graham explaining Graham's number oh. to me on a on a piece of paper, and like that's that that's framed on the wall. That's my keepsake. So delightful. Yeah, yeah. Brady, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on here. I, I've loved being here. Now, I haven't got a piece of brown paper for you, but I have got a present for you before, oh, before we go. Excellent. You can add it to the cave if appropriate, or oh. it can, I'm sure you'll find somewhere for it. I was just at the home of uh, a mathematician who lives over in Oakland. Yeah. Well, he's not a mathematician. He's a... He's kind of a mathematician. He's a number file star, that's for sure. Cliff Stoll. I, Cliff Stoll is one of my heroes. I read Cuckoo's Egg when it first came out. I watched the Nova about it. Yeah. Well, Do you have? I have for you from Cliff himself. No. I, I said I was coming to see you, and he's a fan of yours as well. What? So when I said I was coming to see uh, Adam Savage, he said. Do you have a client bottle? You've got a. He said, you must give this to Adam from I'm me. Gonna, I'm getting choked up right now. Cliff Stoll is the one of the preeminent makers of Klein bottles. There you go. It's oh, yours. Oh my God! It's graduated. <laughs> <laughs> he, he put he put that on especially for you. He has these graduation decals. Oh. Look at the look at the graduations on it though. What it starts and ends at. <laughs> it's all <laughs> zeros. <laughs> it's all zeros because you have a, there's no there's no volume to the Klein Klein oh bottle. Oh my so. goodness! That is. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me on the podcast. What this was an great. honor. Oh, my God. So we'll have to, I'll have to reach out to Cliff and see if he'll come on the podcast because I've been a fan of his since forever. You must go to, he said you must go to his house. I will. Uh, he, he also has all sorts of caves of wonders that you would enjoy. We will trade some cave visits. Yeah, that definitely. is fantastic. I you can't believe this. This is beautiful.
Brady, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. We're going to put a link to Graham's number in the comments below so yes. that people can yeah. uh, get the gateway drug to number five. My be, gateway drug to number be five. Be careful. Be careful. <laughs> you don't think about it too long. Your head might turn into a black hole. <laughs> oh, thanks, guys.